Mm -hmm. It looks like we've gotten everyone in from the waiting room. So that's great. So hi everyone, I'm Sarah Hanawald with One Schoolhouse, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development and New Programs. And I am welcoming a, um, Liz, you're gonna end up on our frequent flyers list. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself to everybody and then we'll get started? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Liz Cates. I'm the Assistant Head for School Partnerships at One Schoolhouse. And along with Dr. Lisa Damore, um, I teach our Steady in the Storm course, Protecting Mental Health, Student Mental Health under COVID-19. Great. Well, thank you. And um, so, yeah, uh, it's, <laughs> it's hard to know um, exactly how to start the conversation about this because it's in the news a lot, right? How kids are doing, um, what's going on, what we're seeing. We're seeing reports of, you know, uh, the news show last night said that access to an anxiety, like a little self-assessment for anxiety was up 800% compared to last year at this time. So yeah. what are you hearing? Well, and that's, I, I, I've been watching those statistics and it was 600 in August. So what I'm hearing is it's getting worse. Um, you know, usually October is kind of like this beautiful moment in schools, right? There are traditions, there's excitement. Um, you know, the little, the little ones are doing their Halloween parade and the big ones are sneaking candy in whenever they can. Um, you know, you're sort of like- Pumpkins everywhere. It's time to get ready for the musical. <laughs> right. Um, you know, honestly, this year, October feels like February. Um, that is our emotional state. Um, and what started out as a rough start to school is settling into a long and difficult year. Um, What's different is that what we're looking at, we're, you know, we, we talked a lot, you know, about trauma informed teaching and, um, and, you know, post traumatic stress, and this is actually very different. What we're talking about not is, is not trauma, but is instead is chronic stress. And this is not to minimize the effects of trauma, which are significant ongoing um, and pervasive for students who struggle with those. But chronic stress is a little different. Um, for one thing, the chronic stress is affecting all of us. It is affecting us as administrators and leaders. It is affecting our teachers. It is affecting our students and it is affecting their parents. So everybody is having the same impacts. We're expressing them differently, but nobody, every single person feels it. Um, the other thing that's different is that chronic stress um, has physical and cognitive and emotional effects. And so being attentive to all three of those pieces is really important for how we're managing the year. So there are physical effects. Um, and you know, my guess is that at least one of these things that I'm about to say, you're about to say, oh yeah, um, I know that I did. <laughs> um, so low energy. So just feeling like every day is a slog. Um, headaches, upset stomach and ga gastrointestinal issues are a big one. And you're probably seeing kids in the, when you're on campus, the kids showing up in the nurse's office saying my stomach hurts. Um, insomnia, um, those are all low grade things. They're not things that rise to the level of, you know, oh my gosh, I have to do something about this, but they certainly decrease our quality of life every day. And then there are cognitive effects. So these are really important at school. So inability to focus, um, and that's for kids who are neurotypical and neuroatypical. So your students who have attention deficit issues um, or attention regulation issues, there you may well be seeing a spike in those. But even for students who typically present very, um, very developmentally typically um, at any age, you're probably seeing some of them with the same inability to focus. Wow. Um, yeah, so you're saying sort of this inability to pay attention that I am feeling sometimes is oh yeah, it's, it's real. Like it's not it's not that you can't do it. It is real. It is cognitive. It is in your our brains. Um, poor judgment is another thing, which is really unfortunate when you think about the kind of self regulation that social distancing requires. Um, disorganization. If you're hybrid and you're going back and forth between school, that's really hard. Um, and just worry, just everything feels big. 
Um, and then sometimes that worry goes from, um, you know, manageable worry to unmanageable anxiety. So that gets us into the emotional effects. Um, that's like agitation, um, frustration. So like a low threshold for frustration, um, which is probably um, sometimes translates into low self-esteem instead of, I can't do this right now. I can't do this. I will never do this. I am a failure. Um, and then that can move over into depression um, and then isolation. And I, by the isolation, I don't mean like staying at home. I mean that you, that people are withdrawing from connections, not just they can't get to see each other, but they're pulling away from relationship. It's a lot. So hang on, I want to dive into that a little bit. So what you're seeing is that there's the have to social distance and there's the have to not contact, but but part of that is leading to people to not even grab the opportunities that they do have to connect. So yeah. withdrawal, it's like a cycle. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yikes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the studies that I looked at said that over half of the 11 to 17 year olds that had been um, surveyed had some thoughts about self-harm or suicide. And that is just a really frightening number. So one of the things that I came across in my research um, was an article from The Lancet, and that is linked to um, in the blog. And Sarah, maybe can you put it in the oh, chat too? Put that in. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so The Lancet is the premier, up, and we're gonna put that up right now, Sherry. Um, the Lancet is sort of like the premier um, medical journal in uh, the UK. Um, and before I talk about it, I wanna back up a second and that's, it's easy to forget because we sort of take it for granted that school has a lot of insulating of practices that insulate students' mental health. You are in community, you are in communication, um, you, um, you're with peers, um, you're getting exercise, you're like going outside at recess or you're getting up and you're walking between classrooms or between buildings or you have PE or sports practice. Um, Student, young people have meaningful relationships with adults who are not in their family. That's another key mental, another key indicator for strong mental health. Um, and there's routine. You know, you're still, even if you're at school, you know, even in the most traditional schools, the bell rings and you get up and you move, you don't just stay there. So there's this way in which you sort of muscle, like, you know, you get dropped off at the front door of the school. And even when you're feeling pretty lousy, you still go in, you know, you still do what's expected of you. Um, and I'm talking here, of course, not about significant mental illness, but about a kind of like low grade. Um, it's a dysthemia is the uh, psychological term for it. It's, it's low mood. Um, like you push through and you learn you can push through even when you don't feel great. So this Lancet article, one of the studies that they referred to was done by a, um, by a mental health advocacy organization in the UK called Young Minds. Um, and they surveyed students and young people with known mental health issues. So these were kids who were already at risk. Um, and um, in April, 83% of those students said that their existing mental health issues had worsened. Um, so these are our most vulnerable to start with. Exactly. And what was really interesting was when I went back this week to take a look and I went back to, not to the Lancet study, but to Young Minds, they actually done another survey. They did it, um, they've done an August, an autumn 2020 survey. Um, and 69% of the respondents and it said that their mental health was poor now that they had returned to school. And that was an 11% jump from where that same group was before school started. Okay. And I'm assuming that that covered a, a wide variety of versions of back to school, right? Am exactly. I remotely? Am I going in a mask? Am I? Okay. Yep. There's a, you know, just like in the US, there is a wide range of practice in the UK right now. Um, and, you know, we're talking about students in all kinds of schools. We're talking about adolescents and college students. So it's a wide swath. It's not a one-to-one -one for our communities, but it, it is a really, there's just, there's not a lot of research out there right now about young people. And so this is really an interesting moment. Um, another thing that was interesting was that 23% of the 
of the people who applied said there was less mental health support in their schools now. Yeah, Only 9% said there was more. So, you know, I want to go back to something that we started with at the beginning. We were talking about October is usually this, you know, rehearsals and we're starting to get in, you know, we're mid-season, kids in sports are hitting their stride, all of these other things that are happening that kids aren't necessarily having this year. And, and you pointed out that once school started their attention, because there's some, there's some signs of um, positivity too, right? Psychologist uh, Jean Twang, or I'm not sure if it's Twang or Tenji, did a survey this summer and reported, hey, teens are getting more sleep than they've ever gotten before. They're spending more time with their families. So there were, there were some upsides. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when that came out, we were all kind of like, oh, uh, you know, there's this kind of silver mm -hmm. lining. And now maybe that's because summer was an era or time period where that's what's supposed to be. And now we're back into what's supposed to be isn't where we are and we're about to hit the time flows that's just so hard for people. So when you yeah. think about all of these pieces coming together at this end of October, yikes, what comes to mind? <laughs> um, so, so to go back for some, some positive things, one thing is that there is a small subsection of kids for whom on distance learning works better than in-person learning. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, let's, let's learn from that for some of those kids who have like social anxiety, students who are high, who are highly distractible, um, like coming, coming home with, with a different, with a, I guess it's a different set of distractions, but a more familiar set or a more manageable one, it's really working well for them. So that's one of the things that's, you know, let's take a look at who it is working well for, because a lot of times those are the kids whom in-person school doesn't work well for. So maybe we can learn some things that, that are really great for that population. Um, and we help those kids when we do come back. Yes, we do. We can. Um, another thing is that hybrid learning seems to bother adults more than it bothers kids. Um, and, and by hybrid, what I mean is on campus, off campus, not concurrent instruction where some kids are in the classroom and some kids are remote. I'm talking about something else here. I'm talking about like when you've got an A team and a B team and the A team is there Mondays and Wednesdays and the B team is there Tuesdays and Thursdays um, because kids are still getting the, the insulating factors. They're getting the peer connection. They're getting the adults and then that sort of pulls them through till the next time. For adults, hybrid learning is really hard, honestly. Um, be, it's hard because of the impact it has on our families and our routines. And for those of us who are teachers, how it approaches our jobs, um, kids are just really happy to be back. Um, and so, so that's, um, you know, part of my job at One Schoolhouse is to talk to schools all over the country. Um, and that is one of the things that I hear consistently is the student, when they come back, the students are really grateful. Um, and that certainly doesn't mean everything is smooth sailing, sailing. There's a lot of wayfinding and it's not perfect and, you know, but they are so glad to be back that they, that it doesn't matter that it's not perfect. They're just really glad and it takes care of them some, and that's really great. That is really good to hear. So I want to go back to something that you touched on earlier, which is school systems and what leaders can do. And so if you were going to share a do this right away, if you're realizing, you know, that this is, is an area that you want to work on as a school, what should a leader who's concerned about student mental health do and take action to do? The first thing they should do is talk about it. It's, it sounds really obvious, but, um, you know, for uh, mental health is not something that we are often comfortable doing for uh, for students who have mental health issues. It's often something they want to keep private. It's not something they want to share. There's a lot of stigma attached to it. Um, I think about um, a 10 year old who I worked with um, uh, at a school who had been diagnosed with depression. He said, I really wish people wouldn't call it mental illness my brain is just different and everybody's brain is different. And it was so eloquent that I think that the first thing we can do is we talk about mental health, health 
as just part of how we talk about health. When we talk about changing bodies, we should talk about changing brains. And just the same way that we talk with little kids about, you know, if you start sneezing or coughing, here's what you should do. If you feel really sad for a long time, here's what you should do. These are this the more that we talk about it, the more people will talk to us about it. Um, so, so that's the first thing is talk about it with your students, talk about it with your parents, don't talk about it as something that's scary, just talk about it. Um, and be really clear about what is, you know, what are the moments when you ask for help, not warning signs, not emergencies. And we all know what, we all know that if somebody's talking about self-harm or harming others, that's an emergency. But really what we want to talk about instead is, hey, here's how you can help. And here are places where you, here's how you can help yourself and in your family. And here are places where you may want to ask more people for help or experts for help or specialists for help. But mental health needs to be part of the conversation in schools. Um, there's a 4-H study that came out this spring um, that I know that I've linked to in other spots. Um, and we can, we can send that out um, or Sarah can, maybe Sarah can find it while we're talking. Um, where I think it, I don't remember what the number was, but it was definitely over 50% of students wanted opportunities to talk about mental health at school. Kids know this is important. So the first thing is to talk about it and talk about it everywhere to your teachers, to your students, to their parents. Um, the second thing is figure is those insulating factors that we talk, talked about, figure out how to build them um, into distance learning. Um, so making sure that kids get time in breakout rooms, making sure that educators have one-to-ones with students, whether it's classroom students or advisees, that you've got time where you're, where you're talking and building relationships. Um, you know, um, as a parent of two school-aged children, um, distance learning PE is um, a big pain um, to figure out, but it's also really important. Um, so, you know, don't, don't lose sight of that. Um, make sure that you're talking to students and to families about the importance of kids being active at home too. And there is a wide range of what being active at home are. Some of our kids can get out and ride bikes in their neighborhoods and some are really in an apartment. So make sure that if you're doing that, that you are really aware of the equity issues around access to outdoor space um, and that you're providing opportunities for all your families. Um, and then uh, the third thing is to identify your students at risk. If we go back to that Young Mind studies, those kids who were already struggling are struggling more now. So identify them um, and make sure that you have a way to follow up and, um, and to track them. That's something that we talk a lot about um, in Steady in the Storm is what are the systems to put in place. I think that systemic approach is important. And one of the things that I've heard you say before is that we don't, teachers are masters at doing a lot of undocumented right things. And so I think about what you said about conversations with adults and kids have adults regularly going, hey, great job, you, you know, I saw you on the field last night or, you know, I'm giving back papers and I say to someone, you know, I've never thought about that before. And a kid just kind of beams. And we've taken all of those interactions away from kids. I'm gonna drop a couple of things in the chat as we go into the Q&A. One of them is a series of questions that adults can ask kids, surveys. Like, are we asking kids regularly, hey, how are you doing? What's the emotional pulse? And I should have done that at the beginning of this webinar. So I hope everybody is having a day where they're able to focus and be here. Um, so I'm going to put a couple of those in the chat. You've got a couple of questions to answer. And one of them is, what do we look for when we can't do the unknown systems? Like, what are some look fors when kids are behind masks and we can't watch them interact with their peers and notice that a child is more withdrawn? Mm -hmm. um, great question. So this is something we've worked at at One Schoolhouse for a long time because we have a limited set of inputs. We're a supplemental school. We see kids in one class. We're asynchronous. Um, and part of that is that academics are a tell 
And when you are online, academics are a faster tell than they are in person. So um, if you see a student's performance going down, if you see their written voice changing, if you see their engagement changing, um, and you know, you'll know that um, by, you know, if you are on on face-to-face -face calls, if you'll you're we all know you can tell when somebody else is clicking in a Zoom call. Um, so just pay attention to that stuff. Um, then um, that one-to-one -one time that we talked about as an insulating factor is also a really important moment to sort of try to get a bead on kids and sort of say, so what are you doing for fun? Um, I, I was just listening to the 10% Happier podcast um, this weekend, and one of the things they talked about was that fun is a trainable skill, which I loved. Um, and, you know, it's more trainable. We need to be trained more as adults than our than young people do. Um, but, you know, ask them, what are you doing for fun? You know, who are you talking to outside of school? Are you seeing anybody in safe and socially distanced ways? Um, if they don't know what they're doing for fun, if they aren't really talking to anybody, you'd pay attention to that if it were at school and pay attention to it here too. Um, and, um, and then just honestly, trust your gut. You know, I can remember one of our one schoolhouse teachers sending me an email saying, can you, can you call this school about this student? I just, something seems off. She's, her writing is different. You know, like she's completing her work like at the last minute, this just seems really different. And so I called the school and I said, so I just, I wanted to check in about this student. You know, is she, is she okay? And they said, how did you know? Um, and she had, she was going through some significant home issues that she had never told her teacher about online. Um, and it was to me just sort of like the most beautiful case of the teacher saying, I'm trusting my gut. Like I can, I'm looking, none, none of these things are a big deal, but something feels off. And she was right. Great teachers know, and we are all lucky enough to work at schools with great teachers. Um, so encourage your teachers to trust their instincts and to ask questions. If they're not gonna ask questions of the student, ask them of the, administ of the advisor or the class dean. But if you're concerned, don't sit on it. I think that is great advice. And so we've got two questions that I want to make sure that we get to. The first one is, how do school leaders draw lines, right? So where is it, um, okay, this student really needs support mm -hmm. and they're on our radar. How much do we do? Where do we ship out? So Lisa has a great metaphor for this. And she says, I am the school mental health nurse as the consulting psychologist at the Laurel School. So if you go to the nurse, you need a band-aid, great. We got you patched up, ice pack, you know, pain, you know, like ibuprofen, we've got that. You've got a gash, like you're really bleeding. I call, I call a parent or you're throwing up, I call a parent to pick you up. We call like there's a real emergency, we call an ambulance. And so our job, your job in terms of a school is to be the patch up and then to, to patch, patch up and pass along. It's a hard one to say. So if you're worried about somebody, get the Band-Aid on. You check in on them and did the Band-Aid, you know, like you check in on them, great. Okay, let me know tomorrow how you're feeling. I'm feeling better, great. Band-Aid was all you needed, that's awesome. You check in tomorrow, you know what? I still feel really, I still feel really terrible. Okay, let's talk about, about a plan. Who can help? What about, you know, is this a place where we talk to parents? Is it a place where we figure out, you know, how to get you, like, you know, you're really missing something. How do we get that for you? But like, then there's a plan. Um, and so knowing the, that difference, you know, your school counselors ideally should not be doing clinical work with your students. They should be they should be assessing situations. They should be providing guidance to other educators in your community. Um, they should be doing short-term work with students. Anything more than that, you should, be get, you should be getting those kids the additional support they need outside of your community. Um, because 
if your school counselor is, bu is busy offering regular clinical support to a small group of students, they're gonna lose the bandwidth to take care of your entire community and you need them for that. It's important. So we have another question and this one is um, one that I think you've probably encountered before, but with the, the pandemic flavor now. Um, so this person's school is mostly in person, but they're seeing a real increase in lower grades due to all of the things that we're discussing. Mm -hmm. So how do academic leaders approach this? Um, Can I ask a question? You're saying they're seeing a real increase and is that in mental health concerns? No, that the grades are actually dropping. Oh, and okay. so they're hitting the end of the quarter. Got it. Okay. And grades are just a lot lower than mm -hmm. teachers are used to seeing. Yes. Um, so this is interesting. One of the things that we know online is that kids um, go down, the kids go down faster when they're online. Now, when you're in person, this is goes back to that cognitive impu um, impact of chronic stress. Kids, our brains are different right now. So it's not surprising that our, that our output is different right now. Um, it's harder to focus, it's harder to make space, it's harder to um, self-regulate. I mean, I think we've all been there and you're like, I feel really lousy. Um, I am having goldfish for lunch today because I like goldfish crackers, even though I know I should have a kale salad with black beans. Um, <laughs> your self-regulation goes a little bit. Um, and for us, you know, we may pack on some extra COVID pounds or we may lose some weight from anxiety. Those don't, don't have big concerns, but when students start to develop an academic deficit, that is, that is a concern. So the first thing is to remind your teachers that the goal is not to make fall 2020 like fall 2019. Yeah. And so the great, I, I, my first question is if the grades are lower, are the expectations have the expectations changed in response to this really extraordinary moment that we are all in? Um, you know, we none of us as adults can do everything that we can do when when the world is working normally. It's not fair to expect our kids to. That is such a good point. And that goes back to something that our head of school started saying last spring, which was, you know, identify those essentials of your curriculum, write your outcomes so that you know that you get the essential parts of your curriculum in. And then I think as teachers look at assessment, you know, you may want to look at some of your policies. If they have made sense for you in the past, they may not make sense this year. Um, I know a lot of schools right now are looking at grading policies such as the impact of the zero. For example, does having a zero and an average really reflect what a student knows, understands, and can do? And, and particularly this year, if it doesn't, um, that it's, it's time to rethink that. And then the other thing that I would say is I would really strongly recommend if you are looking at grades where students are getting into holes, that you are putting a ladder down into that hole and building a scaffold to get back out. Because if, if kids' grades are seen as irreparable or irretrievable by October, oh gosh, right? October or November, if there's no way out and there's no way to get to a better place, that's not gonna feel good to anyone. And we, earlier this year, we had Amy Harward, who is the, uh, executive director of the Association of College Counselors and Independent Schools. And she threw up her hands when she said, colleges aren't sure exactly how they're gonna do with evaluating transcripts. So know that this is not a you problem if at your school you're struggling with this. Colleges aren't sure how they're gonna evaluate transcripts. They know that you know, kids are gonna come from schools that went to pass fail and they're gonna have kids who actually are in school and kids who are gonna do the whole year remote and somehow they're gonna to have to sort through all of this information to assess an application. And it, that is not yours to fix as an independent school leader. It's yours to look at your school and your program and your students and say, are we representing you know, how this student has achieved our learning objectives in our program. Yeah, and I think the thing that I would just come back to is 
you know, um, I know there's a lot of anxiety around from students and parents and teachers all about kids getting behind. And the thing that I, I hope we can agree on as a community is behind what? Like, like what is this magical line behind where they were last year? Yeah, because think about, you know, like this is the difference between, you know, a sprint and the hurdles. It's like, we just put a bunch of hurdles up in front of sprinters. It's gonna take them longer to cover the same amount of ground. We don't hold the hurdlers to the same time trials that we hold the sprinters to. They are running a different race. And that is, that is the thing that I hope we can all remember and, and hold ourselves and our students and our teachers in some compassion. This is a different race. Our teachers are making themselves crazy because they can't get through the same amount of material. No, you can't. And our kids are getting are feeling crazy because they, they can't get the grades that they think they need. And our parents are really worried because what's gonna happen next year when my kids are a senior or you know, if my kid is a, a seven, an eighth grader applying to high schools, what's gonna, oh, the one thing that this has taught all of us is we don't know. So I see this question here, what do you say to your AP teachers? Um, great question. And I'm going to say something a little controversial here. It's that this year, the exam score shouldn't be how we judge the success of the class. I will back you up 100% on that. And I think this is one where we have those big questions that we ask ourselves, what is the best thing for the kids right now in our care? Yeah, I know that for APs that, you know, some of our kids take APs because they love the subject matter. And some of our kids take APs because they feel like that's what needs to be on their resume to get into the kind of college that they want. And I think part of what's so exhausting about this epidemic, about this pandemic, is that all these things that we just assumed were, um, were constant aren't anymore. You know, like you go to, like, what is a school? A school is a place where kids go. Uh-oh, like we just like, nope. Um, you know, what, you know, what is a, like you go to college. Oh, no, you don't. You're doing that in your basement this year. Um, we, we have all been rethinking the logistics and that's really exhausting. And anybody at any school will tell you that just like bathrooms are a big pain in the butt right now. But the thing that I think we are all trying to avoid thinking about is how this calls into questions, into question the way we identify achievement and progress and growth. Because yep. it is making us face all that. And that's hard and it's tiring, but it's also conversations that, that we need to have. I wish we didn't have to have them because it was an emergency. Right. And, and I think that's the place where academic leaders can really serve their communities by saying, here are the things that we have to pay attention to. And if, it, if it's not right now that we're going to make the adjustments, I'm at least going to document what we're doing as we move forward. And we are out of time. We are. <laughs> so I've got to let you go. But I want to say thank you so much for coming today and sharing your insights with us. Well, thanks everybody for being here with us. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.